Hi everybody, this is Amiriad. Welcome to an Eternal card review, deck review. We're going to be discussing the competitive deck bundles uh, and discussing each of the legendaries in them, how they're fitting in the current meta. I've basically been playing around quite a bit in the Expedition meta lately, so I feel like I have a lot of uh, expertise to offer on the competitive decks, what legendaries they have, uh, how good they are in terms of just like general meta awesomeness and like whether or not they're worth the 2000 to spend. Don't pay attention to which ones I have bought, of course, because I primarily bought these just for the legendaries. Uh, uh, there are certain ones that are like particularly good in a bunch of different ways, but uh, yeah, let's go ahead and talk about it. Uh, there's a lot of interesting changes uh, or interesting cards and options that we're going to be going through. And uh, yeah, the question is, are these cards worth it? So first things first, let's look at Churgant's Fury. Uh, and we're going to move this over here so that we can see all the decks. All right, so uh, this is the first of our sets of decks. Uh, you can notice that they have quite a few legendaries in them, quite a few rares. Uh, we're looking at a total of uh, eight legendaries and quite a few rares as well. The Zoltan Conclaves, you've got the Torque Ballistics Crafter. I think some of these are lit up and some of these are not, but yeah, we've got six legendaries or eight legendaries, six rares, and uh, overall, like, for 2k, that's not too bad, particularly if you're looking for the specific legendaries that are in this setup. Are you looking for the specific legendaries that are in the setup? Well, that's a bit more of an interesting question. So, um, going straight down the list, we have Hunting Dragon, a 5-4 Reckless with Summon, Give Hunting Dragon, Flying, or Taunt. I can't say that I've seen this card uh, see any presence in the meta overall, like it's a 4 cost 5-4. The Flying ability is really, really nice, which does make it a very aggressive drop, but uh, because it's Reckless and because the card is just like pretty easy to remove, uh, I think the main thing that really takes Hunting Dragon down is how important it is in the meta to run removal that can deal damage to 4 health units. Like, Shrivel and Searing Fist are just going to be in every deck. And uh, so, like, if you're playing against these types of setups, uh, Hunting Dragon tends to lose tempo pretty quickly because the card basically, like, plays down, immediately gets killed by a 2-drop spell, and then dies and isn't really quite worth it. Icicles is also another one that's, like, really, really popular. So, uh, overall, this Legendary hasn't been making, like, too much of a splash despite being a very well-statted dragon, but uh, it's still pretty interesting. I think if it were, like, uh, a little bit healthier, like maybe a 4 or 5 or something like that, it could potentially see some play, but uh, probably not one of the ones that you're going to be buying the pack for. Unfortunately, the other legendaries in this pack are also, like, a little on the iffy side. Serpent Hive is really strong. This one gives up to two units flying this turn and also plays two 3-3 Sky Serpents with flying. Uh, in addition, if you inscribe it, you can deal one damage to an enemy player or site, which is a really good Frenzy trigger. That Frenzy is really, really important for a lot of different types of decks, including most of the Feln Adept uh, Skycrag lists. Uh, you're going to see a lot of blue, purple, red at the very top end of the ladder that's running stuff like Torque Ballistics Crafter with Serpent Hive and Felm Adept and a couple of other things, and just basically using this card for its inscribability. But it also gets played at 6 on occasion, and when it does get played on 6, it's not a bad card. This is a really reasonable legendary for your expedition setup. It tends to do a lot of work, and uh, I think it is a pretty important one to have two copies of. But unlike some of the other competitive decks, you're only getting it in twos, so this is good if you want to like fill out your collection. Uncrossable Ravine, this is a cool card. Um, I've seen it played a couple of times to pretty good effect. The randomness of the one cost unit usually means that the card is not that great for Expedition, but you can get quite a few different triggers on it and then basically just build like a 10-10 unit while also sweeping the board. I think at the moment it's not an extremely strong card. However, with the prevalence of the Rat King and a couple of other cards that like slightly make this a bit more optional, um, I think uh, the existence of a 3-1 Flyer in the meta that costs five, there are just a few things that you can hit with this that are okay, and then the extra unit on top tends to kind of put you into a slightly better position, but it can also be in bad positions where it deals too much damage to you, puts you into a position where you're actually like not really, <laughs> like, it's not common that you don't want to take one damage to cast a very large unit, but sometimes it happens, and I think uh, in Skycrag in particular, you can get into those trading wars, and this might not actually be perfect for you, and it might not actually kill anything. I think it's a, a decent legendary in the current meta, and it does actually work. Um, you can definitely build decks around it. You could see this in a tournament-ready, like, legendary deck, but whether or not it's, like, extremely strong, I don't know if it's, like, 
immediately worth it. And finally, we have Mass Production. I love this card. This is one of my favorite jank cards to build around. Uh, I don't think it's very strong in uh, current Legendary meta. Like, if you have a lot of different abilities that deal lots of frenzy and, like, actually get that damage through, Mass Production can draw you a ton of cards. But there are two central problems with it. The first is that it is delayed gratification. If you are not paying the, uh, if you're paying the amount that it costs, which is seven, uh, then you just basically lose an entire turn drawing a bunch of cards, and then also have to discard your hand later on, which means you can't draw additional cards, do anything else that actually allows you to draw cards. You have to basically spend all of those cards immediately, which won't always get you over the hump before you suddenly lose out on the late game by discarding your entire hand. That can be a real problem. You can't follow mass production with other mass productions. So like it basically just creates this like setup for a really good turn and then you lose or you lose on the turn that you play it, which uh, both of those things are pretty likely to happen and can reduce your win rate by quite a lot. Uh, if you can play the card for the reduced cost of like, you know, paying zero for it because you frenzied a whole bunch, then that's great. But in order to do that, you have to have the card in your hand pretty early on, which means that your hand is going to be low on one other gas card, low on one other frenzy trigger for your felon depths, low on something. And you have to actually like get to it and play it. Sometimes you'll be able to play it for like four or five, but the thing that I've seen most commonly with mass production is that the card just gets discarded to Black Book because Black Book is almost always going to be capable of targeting this. It is a card that sits in your hand until you're ready to play it. And then, you know, if Black Book discards it, then that's your entire game plan kind of ruined. So uh, it's an interesting two of to be sure. I don't think it's super powerful. And that kind of makes this bundle a little less worth it compared to some of the other bundles. We have some other good stuff in here. Torque Ballistics Crafter is a really important rare in the current set. It does a lot of damage. The Snowball is really relevant. The Spell Damage is really relevant. The Yeti Bonus is really relevant. It's just all good stats all the time. Everything about it is good. Uh, the Common is also nice. Icicles is really important. And you want Zoltan Conclave. It's a solid card in general. So if those are enough, like Zoltan Conclave, Torque Ballistics Crafter, and Uncrossable Ravine Serpent Hive. I think those kind of make up the value, but I wouldn't necessarily pay 2k for this deck uh, just to like get it into a tournament. Now, I would say that basically with any of these decks, we haven't actually talked about this, but with any of these decks, you could definitely rank one of these decks up to Diamond without really making any changes. But if we were to make changes, what would we change? Well, first off, of course, we'd obviously change up some of the 2 ofs versus the 4 ofs. I'd probably be running 4 Serpent Hives. I might be shifting into Shadow to get access to a lot of the really powerful stuff there. Stone, Breaker, Bow, uh, Felna Depth, that kind of stuff. Uh, there's a lot of really good decks in the blue, red, purple vein that share a lot of cards from this deck list with a lot of the good cards from other shadow deck lists. So that's a pretty reasonable thing to be going after. Um, I'd definitely be cutting Beaker Blast and Warning Shot. These are cards that are like pretty mediocre unless you have spell damage, and uh, like even with spell damage, they're not amazing. Cleave is pretty strong, but Barbarian Gorillas has kind of been replacing it a lot. I think if you're going for direct damage, it can be decent, but also, like, the reliance on your enemy having an attachment can be tricky. There are some decks that just don't run them. Uh, Tomb of the Azure Mage is also, like, eh, it's okay. The Frenzy ability is really, really good, uh, but the combination of the Frenzy and the Ultimate both just doing kind of nothing for card advantage means that the card is just, like, a little bit on the iffy side. I like Dark Card Acolyte. This is a cool change. Uh, I think you could build the deck around Dark Card Acolyte, but if you want a more aggressive option, then you probably are putting Plunk Lumpkin in here and trying to go more aggressive rather than try to go for more Frenzy Triggers and win out in the late game. Frostburn, really good card, definitely well played. Crankle Boys, decent card, definitely well played if you want a lot of different Frenzy Triggers. Reverberating Strike is, I think, a little too expensive. And uh, Churganth Ice, Re Ice Regent, I... okay... I completely missed this card. It is a legendary as well. Uh, it, I, it's funny that I missed it because it's Churgan's Fury, but I was looking again for all the legendaries that were highlighted, not the one that's just here. <laughs> uh, Churgan is a very good card, and this would actually be the reason to buy this deck. 
5-4, gives the numbing cold, which is pretty powerful for a contract, uh, and also means that you can protect your flyer. When you deal spell damage, it gets additional strength. This card's a nightmare on 5, and it can be really, really rough to deal with. Obviously, like, if they break the contract and kill the Cheerganth, that's a lot, but I would say that overall, like, this card still probably plays pretty well. I haven't seen a lot of it in the current Expedition meta, but uh, I was seeing a lot of it at the beginning of the month, and I think it was very strong then. Uh, it probably got moved around due to, like, I think the prevalence of Stonebreaker Bow, uh, a couple of other things, like, changing up that made it, like, slightly less good. It's still kind of a slow card at 5, considering that Skycrack decks can be getting going very, very quickly. But overall, this card will win you a lot of games and push you pretty far, and there are definitely some, like, tournament-ready decks that run Cheergath Ice Regent, so... Pretty important stuff. Skycrack Adept is fine too. This is mostly a good draft card, but I think it's okay in uh, some Skycrack lists. I don't think it's an amazing option for that meta setup, but you can do some decent stuff with it. So the overall construction of the deck is decent. It needs some work in the lower end in particular, and you need to cut like mass production and get into like a few more foros in the top end. But this plays. This actually does do some work, and you could be you could definitely get it up to diamond, I think. This one would be one of the harder ones to get up to diamond, but you could definitely work with it. All right, next up is Valley's Law. This is definitely probably one of the ones that if you are looking for legendaries and good rares, you're probably going to want to buy. There's a couple of different reasons for this. Uh, first off, Furious Magnaventress. Uh, this card's got, uh, I mean, this is the alt art Magnaventress, which is very, very pretty. A lovely, lovely card. Uh, and uh, yeah, the alt art Shurgan from the previous one was really, really neat as well. But yeah. Magnaventress is like a very popular card in the current meta. It is still a very good card despite it being nerfed from 5 health to 4 health. That does mean that it gets reduced by like Shrivel and Searing Fists and all of that stuff, but it's still in that situation where if you're playing this with Lunar Claw, you probably have the start of a good deck. And uh, there is no Lunar Claw in this particular list, but that would be one of the first things that I add, probably cutting Brigade Hall or something like uh, maybe even Hour of Kodash, I'm not sure. It depends on where your, your setup is. Bejeweled Knuckles, probably. Okay, so Magda Ventress, great rare, really, really solid. Poacher's Menagerie decks were really, really popular at the beginning of the month, and uh, the capability to destroy relics is very, very important at the higher levels. You have to actually have that ability, or else you're going to get like slowly ground out by decks like these. This is a slower card. Uh, it's... Uh, comparable to something like Arcanum's True Heart, where you're getting a ton of value over time, but there are lots of ways that the card could just sort of disintegrate to just a single removal, either Barbarian Gorillas, or in the case of Arcanum's True Heart, something else. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, this is something where you can get, like, an incredible amount of value out of this card. It's really, really powerful if you can protect it, but protecting it is a little bit difficult. There's a lot of different ways to look to that. You could do Sharp Tactician, the 1-3. You could set up a bunch of face aegises and hope that's good enough to beat barbarian gorillas. Uh, there's some decent stuff there that uh, kind of works out. Oh, it's not Sharp Tactician. Uh, the 1-3 the red that uh, reduces the cost and makes it so your relics can't be killed. Uh, I thought it was Sharp Tactician, but I think I, I am mistaken. Regardless, this is a really reasonable rare that will definitely get you to climbing. Um, so if you're looking for just like some good cards to start, this is a good rare to get. Uh, and most importantly, at the top of this list is not even the alt art card. It's Black Book Pit Boss. Uh, one seven Endurance Taunt Warcry two for my money. Probably the strongest card in the current Expedition meta. Um, there are a few other things around like this sort of deck that really do quite well. Um, I would say that like Black Book is still a little slow. Uh, people are starting to play around it a lot more. I am seeing less of it now in Top 100 Master, but. This is still like a really, really good card for a lot of different reasons. Uh, first off, you always get the card worth of advantage when you discard the spell or attachment of their choice. It tends to be something pretty important that you're picking out of their hand because it's probably an expensive spell. Uh, if they have an expensive spell, even if they have just like a good combat trick, something like that, Black Book gets rid of it, and it also <laughs> tends to get rid of the things that can remove it. Uh, you can't say display a passion a Black Book Pit Boss because Black Book Pit Boss discards display of passion. Uh, all of that kind of stuff really, really, like, leads to some problems, and I have seen just, like, straight Arjunport Minotaur decks, like, do incredibly well in this format, because the Unleashed Minotaur at 4-3 that attacks and get bo gives bonuses to other Minotaurs is really, really good. 
Um, the relic that gives uh, all your Minotaurs plus two plus one is incredible with Black Book Pit Boss, and also gives you a bunch of like units to sacrifice and or charge in with. Uh, the value that Minotaurs offer is really, really strong, and Black Book synergizes really well with that. But on top of all of that, this card stalls out the board on the ground, picks up a lot of cards by basically just picking off all of your opponent's smaller units, the one health units. Uh, it can trade in with other stuff if you finest hour it, or if you threaten it, uh, give it uh, the sill sight to give it extra bonuses. There's a lot of different synergies that work with Blackwood Pit Boss to basically turn it into a card advantage engine. And that card advantage engine is very hard to kill because the card is already getting value when it plays by discarding that attachment and making sure that it can't be killed very easily. So Black Book Pit Boss is an incredibly strong legendary to be putting in these lists, and you actually get three of them instead of the two of that you get in the Cheergant set. This is really, really good. I would say that this is definitely worth the pickup uh, just for Black Book, but also because like most of the other rares in here are really playable. Furious Magnet of Interest, super good card. Sharp Tactician, actually quite strong. Does a lot of work in the current meta, tends to be a 6-6 six, six when it comes out because a lot of the things that you're going to be silencing are going to have at least two skills, and you can get a very, very big unit for a very, very small cost. In addition, silencing other units is really important. This is one of the best ways to do that. Like, if you silence a Felna Depth with this and get a 4-4, four, four, that's not a bad deal. That feels pretty good. If you silence, like, the 5-5 five, five Endurance Unleash, it's, like, a little bit less good, but you can do some decent work with that. Most of the time, though, you're going to hit things with battle skills, and you're going to get good benefits off of it. The Jeweled Knuckles isn't super worth mentioning. It's an okay, decent relic weapon, but Stormhelt Plating is definitely the good top end here. The Inscribe ability is really relevant, and this is top end where once you play it, you probably are winning the game. You don't usually get to 8 very commonly in the current format, uh, so it is a little bit difficult to play Stormhelt Plating in that front, but since it's an Inscribe card, you can keep it in your deck, use it for the Inscribe, and then when you get to 8, you just have this huge value engine that breaks up just about everything except Black Book. <laughs> Uh, it's a very, very good legendary. Black Book is a very, very good legendary. Combined with Poacher's Menagerie, Sharp Tactician, and Furious Magnaventress, as well as Mystical Shackles, which is a premier removal card due to its ability to hit stuff like Inferno Phoenix and other things without like really getting you into a lot of threat, and also due to the fact that it kills just anything. It isn't very selective compared to other green removal. I'd say this is a pretty good list because all of the rares and legendaries are big hits for Expedition. Uh, in addition, we also have Call the Hit, Crime Watch Paladin, Tinker Unionist. All of these, I would say, are Expedition common cards. Unseen Marksman, a little less so, but a 3 3 for 2 is never bad. Victimless Crime, also really, really good. Uh, the only cards here that are like kind of misses, we're not seeing a lot of Hour of Kodash, we're not seeing a lot of Brigade Hall, uh, but like we are seeing a lot of Slay. It's a really, really good card as well. Basically, everything in this list is a winner. Uh, the numbers are the only thing that need tweaking about it, and I would say this is probably the strongest of the five decks, just due to the sheer quantity of good hits. Also, each of these does contain Archibor Tome, which you're going to need if you're just starting out. Uh, that is just an important card to have. Okay, Curiox's Journey. So this one's a little bit less good. Uh, there's a couple of different things in this one that are not so amazing. First off, looking at the legendaries, we have Voltar Curiox All Seeing, which uh, this card is reasonable. I have seen it played a couple of times, but I haven't seen Elysian played to a pretty significant extent in Expedition. So like, and in those cases, a lot of times playing a 5-5 five, five Flying Endurance with a contract ability that's okay. Uh, I would say that like this is reasonable. The card draws great. The endurance and flying is nice. It does give you this nice value engine, but it's a slow card with uh, that's pretty easy to remove, and that can get you into a lot of trouble considering how aggressive the current metas are. Like there's a lot of people that are just like. Basically, I would say that there's a lot of, like, playing cards that can actually deal damage is really important. Your health pool matters. Uh, in those situations, grindy cards like Curiox All Seeing are not as strong. This is still an okay legendary, and I think it could belong in some expedition decks that could actually be very, very good, uh, but it depends really on what you're seeing. All Head Mount Breaker, 
little bit better. Uh, the Inspire ability is really, really nice. This card does basically like put you in that like Hojin territory where if it stays on the board, it definitely wins you the game because the amount of like extra stats it's giving you is really, really good. But it is a little bit generic. Um, the stat line is good, but it doesn't have any battle skills. It's got like an ultimate that's pretty poor to middling. And the Inspire is the main thing that you're looking for, which is delayed gratification. And uh, we talk a lot about how you really want sort of like immediate onboard impact to get the best benefit. All Head is okay. I think this is a reasonable legendary as well. Both of these are not like really like making any waves in current expedition metas, but uh, I might, you know, be proven wrong come the expedition open. They could definitely see some play. Torgoth Ice Cap Trader is an incredibly good rare that should be in basically, like, uh, has always been, like, an excellent expedition choice. This is a really, really strong card to be putting uh, into your decks. Hexavore is also really, really good. 3 cost 4-4 four, four is an incredibly good stat line. This fits in a slot that is, I think, really, really important for stuff like, uh, like basically anything that you're looking for. I would say it's a really, really reasonable rare in these particular respects. And combined with like the sort of meatiness that this deck is offering, uh, this kind of like sort of just basic makeup of just good statted cards in Elysia really does a lot of work. Stuff like Happy Harvester doesn't hurt either. Uh, there is some bad news though. Phineas still here. Not a card that's seeing a lot of play right now. Three cost two, three is just a little bit slow. The takes damage and survivability is neat, and the attune ability is also okay. Like, uh, this deck is trying to combo up with Zoltan Eldermark, Amber Lock, and Hour of Grodoff, and just make sure that you get the cards back, even though you're not really, like, doing a lot with Phineas. But I would say that, like, getting back an Amber Lock or an Hour of Grodoff is not an amazing swing at the moment. Tempo really matters, and Phineas does not have good tempo. Uh, the idea here is to combo it with Trials and Tribulations, which is, yeah, that's a very good combo. Trials and Tribulations will definitely win you some games. I think that, like, while Phineas is a slow setup, and Trials and Tribulations is a slow setup, uh, this is a deck that, like, due to its general grindiness, will win out against decks that are less well-tuned. Uh, that's the reason why, uh, like, I would say once again that all of these decks can be ground to diamond at the very least, won't necessarily necessarily get you to Masters without further tweaking, uh, but yeah, Phineas and Trials can definitely do some work. Um, so yeah, there's some good stuff here. Uh, I think the Legendaries are okay here. Uh, Hexavore, the Rares are a little better. You do get Torgoth, you do get Hexavore. If you don't have these cards already, these are pretty good cards to pick up. I wouldn't say that like Curiax or Alhead are going to be like breaking your bank. They're really good cards, they're really fun to play with, but like overall this is like a bit too slow of a deck to be playing with. Uh, most of these cards, though, really, really strong. Definitely cards that you're going to be playing with a lot. You're going to be using Permafrost, Amber Locks. Uh, you're going to be using Torgoth's Wares occasionally. Trials and Tribulations is pretty good. Polymorph is, like, you know, kind of a staple. Some of the commons and stuff are decent. And this comes with Greater Plans, which is pretty nice if you got a lot of uh, heroes. I think in this case, yeah, there's a few. Uh, you're missing, like, a lot of the heroes early. Phineas is your only hero early, so, like, if you draw a hand that's just good and aggressive, you might not be able to use greater plans, but uh, good power is always a nice little add on top of that. So Curiox's journey, middle of the road for the buys, but uh, definitely provides a couple of useful options. All right, Vikram's Cruelty. Uh, you do want Vikram, so this is likely to be pretty strong. Uh, we can see from the list of rare cards in this deck that this is actually going to be a pretty good one. Uh, so, first things first. Evelina Valley's Guardian? Yep, great card. Uh, also comes with Greater Plans, which is pretty significant as well. Evelina is doing a lot of different things in the current meta. The Charge ability is really, really nice. The card provides value with the 5-5 five, five Dinosaurs. The card has not Scribe, which is really, really important for a lot of your 5 drops, because it just means that you can play into your 5 drops without getting into too much trouble. Uh, it basically makes an empty board into a bit of a problem. It trades well with anything with 5 health or less, which uh, there are a lot of 5 health cards in the current meta. Most of times cards stop at 5. Uh, you can see basically like there's there's Dunehill Clan, uh, which is a 5-5. Five, five. There's Krogar, which is a 5-5. Five, five. Uh, and then most everything else is just not going to be 6 health. So Evelina will typically charge in and either get a trade or swing in for damage and then get a dinosaur on top of that to trade with the 5-5 five, five on the block. Which, uh, yeah, those are both really, really good. Uh, I think this card tends to see a lot of play. I'm not using it in my current Praxis lists, but I think it's a good rare and a really, really strong one for a lot of different choices. Uh, I would say it's like definitely up there in terms of rare quality. Black Mock Carnosaur, this one's really, really strong under certain circumstances. I've seen it played a lot as a stabilization tool. The Lifesteal ability is just really, really good. The Taunt ability is also quite nice. 
Um, both of them come into play when you actually like need them, which is pretty important. Uh, I would say the deadly on the 6-6 six, six is also a kind of decent thing that makes the card pretty hard to deal with. Uh, it's easy to remove, but it is a good stabilization tool that tends to be a great slam on 5 when people are running out of cards, might not have removal for it, and the lifesteal swing from it is just so good that you are frequently going to completely stabilize off of it. So this is a reasonable legendary to be putting in the list. Uh, we talked about Greater Plans. Light Hoof is actually pretty okay. Sacking Relics is really important in Shadow, and Unblockability is also good. And Minotaurs are also very good, for reasons that we've already talked about. Um, but here's the two winners, right? Huntmaster Vikram. 2-3, rare, uh, with a lot of goods to text on it. So, can be played as a 5-3 on an empty board. That's a big deal. Uh, especially since it's a 5-3 with Charge, which for 4 is... Bad news. Um, if this card is played onto a non-empty board, it steals one of their units and it keeps it for a while. It also exhausts the unit, which means that if you like basically get the unit back, it's going to be a little bit tricky. Uh, it does ready, I think, at the end of turn or whatever like that, but it's just like a card that tends to get rid of a blocker, give you some bonuses, and it's notably really, really strong against endurance units. This card is time's worst nightmare. It's really, really hard to deal with. Uh, you can take a lot of things that are going to be problem children. Uh, you can steal Inferno Phoenixes without activating the Inferno Phoenix. You can steal Dune Hill Clans and actually attack with the Dune Hill Clan because the uh, any card with endurance gets to attack after Vikram is played. Um, there's a lot of big problems with this card, and it's a card that everyone has to be able to remove uh, pretty handily, and if they can't remove it, you're likely to win the game off of it. I think this is a really, really good card that sees a lot of play in basically any competitive scene in list, uh, tends to see a lot of play in general, and it's just very, very strong. Rat King, also really, really strong. 3-2 gives you two 1-1 one, one rats. That's an incredible amount of stats for three. And on top of that, you can use it to basically just give negative one, negative one to anything that you like. Kill off anything that's got small tokens on it. Make things with revenge, not have revenge. Uh, this answers a lot of problems that you wouldn't necessarily think that you would need to answer. But it does a really, really good job of it in general. It also provides you with a lot of cannon fodder. So even if the card gets removed, you have devour targets, you have combust targets. Targets. Uh, this card plays super well in Stone Scar, super well in Shadow. It's just an amazing rare. Uh, if you don't have this one, this is a strong reason to pick this card up uh, in general. Um, and like just by itself, I would say this card is making Arcanum's True Heart and a couple of other like insane Praxis cards completely unviable in the meta. Uh, you just can't basically play a card that's going to get removed by this three drop and then just never get to play again. Uh, yeah, one health units have a lot of problems with this card. I think this is actually, frankly, a little bit over buffed. Uh, and it is just, yeah, very, very nasty. So between these two cards, your rares are really doing a lot of work in the Vikram's Cruelty deck. Grumbo Total Legend is a card that gets completely out of control uh, if it's left alone. It's hard to leave it alone, but I would say that, like, you know, when you slam this and it actually goes off, that's great. When you slam this and it gets removed, that's probably fine, too. You're not really too unhappy about it. And in addition, we're also seeing, like, the Waystone Igniter and the Rat King, which are two extremely good combo cards with Grumbo. Both of them do a lot of work. Both of them are really, really powerful. Uh, Waystone Igniter can kill dinosaur nests while also making a 4-3, while also making an extra unit for Grumbo. Uh, all of those things are really, really relevant, and you can do them at one, so you can basically like pay three, or pay three, play Grumbo, play Waystone Igniter, get a thing, and then you have a 3-3 Grumbo, which puts him quite far out of the uh, realm of where you want to be. I think Igniter's a little bit slow, but I do think it's a top-tier legendary, and that combined with a bunch of really solid rares and a middle-tier legendary that I would say is still really playable, uh, this is like a really, really good deck on that front. You've also got Zito Cabal Housecat, Naheed's Faithful, uh, in... I wouldn't say Endangered Curran is part of, like, common expedition decks right now, but, like, Nahid's Waystone, Through the Unknown, this is, like, actual stuff that you're seeing a lot in the later metas. And, uh, you know, you also have Lurking Brute, which is good for Minotaurs, you have Della Free Prophet, which is just good in general. It's not an amazing card by any means, but the Invoke is really nice, and the Light Steel is really nice, and... I see this card really do really well, I think, at the lower tiers. I think it's something where, if you're doing the grind, this is going to get you quite a ways, and then when decks start to get to be like a bit more focused and have run a lot more Rat Kings, Delith becomes a lot worse in that respect.
But overall, pretty solid stuff. Won't remark on, like, Humbug's Nest. It's fine. But, you know, there's a couple of other things here that are, like, eh, reasonable stuff. Uh, Endangered Cairn and Devour, both solid commons. Do some good work. All right. Uh, finally, we've got Arcanum's Radiance. It's probably the one I know the most about, since basically I think <laughs> we uh, published a list not too long ago that was like, oh, yeah, this is almost exactly this list. We were playing around with a lot of these same cards. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so let's talk about it, right? Uh, Bullseye is still a pretty good card, despite not killing relics. Seek power, always good to have. Endangered Kirin, yep, great. Jiren Yeti, also really good. These two combined basically mean that you're pretty likely to get your five drops. Um, it's not always the case. I don't think people remove Jiren Yeti all that often anymore, but because the power burst is just so threatening. But uh, that does mean that this card is much more aggressive, and that's always really nice. Now, into the rares and legendaries, we have a lot of good stuff going on here. First off, Miner's Musket. I would say this is like a core card in red right now. Unleash is just such a powerful mechanic, and Miner's Musket is the primary Unleash trigger. It is just basically like, oh, you need to use this to remove stuff like Plunk Womkin, the Rat King on occasion. There's plenty of different targets for it. They're pretty important, and you need to play this card in general. Something times it's not going to kill anything, but the cost reduction is good enough because if you hit, say, a Barbarian Gorillas or a Dunehill Clan, there's a possibility that you just win the game. Um, and that is, like, a pretty wild thing to say about a two-drop. Uh, but, yeah, like, if you play a Barbarian Gorilla, if you play four Barbarian Gorillas on turn four, uh, that is pretty hard for people to deal with, particularly if you're an aggressive deck. If you play two Dunehill clans on turn four, uh, that is also very hard to deal with and typically means that they're going to lose. Uh, if you get like three of them on turn six, that's also an issue. Like basically the scaling that Miner's Musket offers you is just off the charts. The card is incredibly good at luck sacking into particular things, and when it's not luck sacking, it's probably doing something like giving you a free Miner's Musket, or giving you a cheap Inferno Phoenix, which is also pretty nuts. Cheap Reva, cheap Inferno Phoenix, cheap Solix, all of that stuff is just like, oh yeah, no, that's definitely way up there. Uh, okay, what else have we got? We got Sindane Arcanum Curator. This rare is really, really strong in Praxis. I am not a big fan of it. I think it's, like, a little too slow, and, uh, there's a lot of, like, more aggressive Praxis stuff to be done, but I will not deny its power. This basically just draws you an additional card, it gets you the power burst, which is nice if you can actually pay the contracts, and, uh, it's never, like, a bad thing to play. I think overall feels pretty good, does a decent amount of work, and uh, reasonable rare to be sure in Praxis. It's not like my favorite card by any means, but I would definitely say this is an A plus, or an A rare. Um, Dune Hill Clan, this is like the meat and potatoes of any time deck right now, because Arcanum's True Heart is just completely unplayable due to Rat King and a bunch of other stuff kind of making it a lot worse, uh, and also Arcanum's Heart is very slow, which is the other reason that you're not really going to be playing it quite as much. Dune Hill Clan is the primary replacement for this, and there's a bunch of different reasons why. First off, really incredibly well statted, has endurance, which is a huge deal, um, like that is just like very, very important for a lot of different reasons. The only thing that it's kind of bad against is Vikram, uh, but overall, like this is just like a very, very meaty, difficult card to deal with that also synergizes well with Miner's Musket. So that that rare plus Miner's Musket, really making the rares very good. Steward of Prophecy, this is like a core set card, so you might already have this one, but it is definitely a good one, and uh, we talked a lot about why we were using this to beat out stuff like Black Book uh, and other things that are like fairly nasty. This can hit Inferno Phoenixes, it can hit a lot of the scary five drops that are fairly important, and it can hit some stuff that isn't important as well and be still okay on board. Steward is kind of in the middle of the road as far as rares go. I think sometimes you just need it and sometimes you don't, and it really depends on how like complicated the meta is and how late game the meta goes and how unit dependent the meta is. But Black Book, I think, demands Steward of Prophecy, so having two copies of it feels pretty good. Now, uh, for my money, <sighs> I think Black Book is the best of the five decks, the one with Black Book. Uh, but this one definitely has, like, the most cohesive setup. 
because I would say that, like, this is not far off from, like, what is the champion Praxis list. And the reason for that is three Inferno Phoenixes, four Reva Crimson Blurs, and two Soul Explaining Radiances. And I think those numbers are pretty good, too, because I'm actually not that big of a fan of Solux, but I do think that the card is in contention with the other two for strongest legendaries in Praxis. Five Drop is just where Praxis lives right now. There's a lot of really, really good stuff going on here. Reva Crimson Blur plays into a lot of your other good stuff, allows you to deal a bunch of damage, and basically, like, actually gets you, like, really, really good benefits on top of everything else that you're looking for. Like, the extra power it's giving you is amazing. It tends to lead into other cards being played on top of this card, so you get a big flying charge creature that's fairly hard to deal with. You then play another card on top of it, maybe a Dunehill Clan, and then later on, this card starts empowering your Unleashes, allowing you to play more Dunehill Clans, more Barbarian Gorillas. Maybe it just gets you, like, that extra oomph you need to play two units at the same time. Uh, either way, card's really reasonable. It's a solid, solid player. Uh, Inferno Phoenix, this almost always deals six damage to your opponent's face, and when it doesn't, uh, it's pretty rare, I would say. And then, when you kill it, it is just a huge problem for the rest of the game, because you're playing Praxis, and anything getting double damage charge or flying is a problem. Maybe you're giving double damage to a Dunehill clan. That's pretty good. Maybe you're giving charge to a Reba Crimson, or charge to like a Steward of Prophecy or something. And that's still like good damage and good like overall setup. Uh, if you give double damage to a Reba Crimson Blur, pretty A+. Plus. Uh, I'm not 100% certain on how the stacking works on this. I like... I thought I knew, but I'm I'm not I'm no longer like 100 certain. I'm pretty sure that like if you have a Reaver Crimson Blur on top of your deck, it's always going to get double damage. And like regardless of the other things, there's like a bunch of interesting choices with that. And combined with stuff like Soul Explaining Radiance and Reva, like that means that you can actually get a lot of really good stuff going pretty quickly. So Inferno Phoenix is powerful, very, very nasty. You're going to see this card a lot in the Expedition meta. And uh, while it is like something that people can deal with, they typically don't deal with it on the turn that it's played, which means it is, at the very least, an obliterate to face. Like, oh, yeah, I deal six damage to you, and then you Mystical Shackles it? That sucked, but I still dealt six damage to you, which is just, like, fairly important. Finally, you have Soul Explaining Radiance. Uh, there are a few reasons I don't like this one quite as much as the other two. It is incredibly strong for a lot of reasons, obviously. Five cost, four, four flying charge endurance. You get the four damage off the bat. You get a good blocker. You get the killer ability, so you can use it as a removal. The killer ability is repeatable. You silence their void. And you have the ultimate where it turns into an 8-8. And if you pay that ultimate, then you probably just win. Uh, all of that's really, really solid. Uh, the main reasons I don't like this one quite as much are just related to, like, general stats. Uh, Reva and Inferno Phoenix both do a little bit more to add pressure to the board. Uh, Reva in terms of, like, being able to play additional units, and Inferno Phoenix in, a, in the uh, ability to deal extra damage and also, like, set up your later game when it's removed. Solix is something where you are waiting for the killer to get the best benefit out of it, you do get some benefit immediately with the 4-drop damage, like, that's decent. But uh, overall, this card does have to live to see the most benefit and be the card that, like, is gonna win the game. Uh, like, if Inferno Phoenix lives, it's gonna just kill him. If Solix lives, then you get to remove one of their units. Yeah, that's fine. So, yeah, like, there are some th reasons why I don't like this one quite as much. That isn't to say that this card isn't A+, plus, like, top-end Praxis. It's really, really solid, uh, and it's, like, definitely one of the stronger legendaries that you can play with. You can do a lot of different stuff with this. Um, yeah, the pay 8 ability is really, really good. This card does have some vulnerability to Vikram, obviously, because it's got Endurance, which means that it can just come back right... <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's really, really bad against Vikram, which is a bit of a problem, because you play a 4-4 flyer, you deal their damage to their face, and then Vikram steals it, takes the killer, uses it to kill one of your other units, maybe kills the Solus on top of that, which means that your removal no longer matters on Vikram, which is, that is that is such a beating that it's actually worth avoiding in some circumstances. Um, but overall, this card is quite powerful, and uh, I would say it's one of the top-end legendaries in Praxis. The only problem is that it's competing for the slot with these two cards. Uh, so yeah, three extremely good top-end legendaries. 
awesome rares. Dunehill Clan, Sindane Arcadum Curator, Miner's Musket, Steward of Prophecy, which I would say is more of a tech card, but still a tech card that you definitely want access to. And finally, you even get Zoltan Conclave, which is an important uh, option for making sure that you can spend some removal. I actually only use two Zoltan Conclaves in my decks as well, because uh, the amount of damage that it deals you means that you have to be a little bit uh, generous with this, but this allows you, combined with Praxis Tome and Seed of Impulse, to get into some three influence cards and start playing some other like top end legendaries. Uh, I would say that this deck right here might actually be the most complete out of all of them. Uh, it is doing just a lot of things that are really, really relevant. Uh, the only cards in it that are kind of whiffs are Sindane's Bracers, which you don't really need the maximum power all that much. It's a relic that doesn't do anything. And I mean, I wouldn't say Ageless Mentor is a whiff here because your fives and your fours are so strong. But uh, overall, I think this card is a little worse in Expedition meta due to the fact that it is very reliant on your draws and your initial hands. And it doesn't have any like immediate onboard gratification, which uh, a lot of your other three drops might. Um, like Hexivore would be my swap for this but beyond that i think this is like this deck can get you to masters this is a really really strong deck overall and it's also filled with strong legendaries and strong rares uh in terms of like which legendaries you most want i think you're probably going to be looking at uh, valley's law before you look at arcanum's radiance but uh if you want to play praxis arcanum's radiance is going to set you up in a lot of good ways so yeah um based on that what would we recommend for the bundles? Uh, I do think Arcanum's Radiance is pretty important. Valley's Law, really, really good. Vikram's Cruelty is more better for its rares than its legendaries. Like, some of its legendaries are okay, but there's definitely some good stuff in there. And, like, the same is true of most of these other ones. Like, Curiox's Journey has some good rares, but mostly it doesn't have a lot of good cards in general. Hexivore is, like, the only main reason that I pick it up, that Torgoth. Uh, and then, like, this one is just, like, a little bit messy. It's a little bit more scattered at the top. You're only getting two ofs of some of the things, and then some of the things you're getting two ofs are not cards that you're going to be using quite as much. So, like, uh, these two fall a little lower in my recommendations. But Valley's Law and Arcanum's Radiance, super worth the buy. And, you know, obviously you should just buy these based on which legendaries you actually need, but um, if you are looking for just a deck that you can play right off the gate that will actually do really well, I think Arcanum's Radiance is the place to go. That is, like, the strongest one by far. Valley's Law is the one that you can do a little bit of tweaking to and have an extremely powerful Master's Ready deck. Uh, this card will, this one will do a lot of work with for you. And the same is true, I think, of Vixfrom's Cruelty, although the general card quality here is a little bit less good. This one builds into a Master's Ready deck very, very quickly. The other two take a little bit more work, not too much more work. I think all of them have like a pretty solid like baseline setup that you can use. And I wouldn't be surprised if you could get Masters with any of them. Uh, I know I'm almost certain you can get Diamond with all of them. So... Yeah, that's my basic review of the different bundles. Uh, they are all real, real solid expedition lists, and uh, they only require a little bit of tweaking, particularly Arcanum's Radiance, which ready to go right out the box. Um, very, very solid stuff. So, uh, yeah, hope that helped for people who are considering which of these uh, bundles are worth it and which ones aren't, and uh, for people who just wanted to know what's going on in the current uh, expedition meta. That was the basic plan. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. And uh, we'll be back with more brews and other stuff very, very soon. Cheers.